The first thing is that uh, I'd like to say that John Wesley Harding is really a, quite separate from what comes after it. I mean, I know John Wesley Harding ends with two sort of country songs, Down Along the Cove and I'll Be Your Baby Tonight. And when I first wrote about them, I sort of assumed that they were kind of parodies of country songs, um, you know, because it was so unlike Bob Dylan to be to be singing that kind of stuff. But then when uh, Nashville Skyline came out, of course, uh, there we were. The, it was it was all there. But the rest of John Wesley Harding is different, isn't it? I mean, it's much more spare. I mean, it, yes, it's very different from Blonde on Blonde in having lost the surrealism, but it certainly hasn't offered the kind of country music simplicity that we get on the albums that follow it. It's, uh, it's all very severe, isn't it? One of the ways in which it uh, stands out is as a rebuke to what else was going on in rock music when it came out at the very, very beginning of 1968. You know, everyone's albums were becoming double albums. People were starting to uh, be snobbish about releasing singles. Um, many acts just didn't. Blonde on Blonde, of course, had been a double album, and and uh, I'm very pleased that it was because I wouldn't want any of it cut out or squashed up. But um, but you know, then we get Sergeant Pepper, and uh, that is such a lavish sort of packaging of uh, of stuff, uh, and you know, the tracks are miraculously recorded on a four track machine, but it sounds as if it's got lavish orchestras and everyone in the world playing on it. And, you know, the Rolling Stones did uh, Satanic Majesty's Requests and um, Jefferson Airplane did After Bathing at Baxter's. We were getting into a very self-indulgent, solemn, excessive uh, kind of uh, rock. And Bob Dylan comes along with an album that could hardly be more spare and severe it, it just couldn't be, you know, and, and it's so infested with uh, uh, biblical language. Uh, and this, of course, is something that uh, he has always done and always, uh, always does, even um, blowing in the wind, quotes from biblical text, everything he does. I mean, he, you know, he has been inward with the Bible forever. But he's never made a more outwardly biblical album than John Wesley Harding, aside from the rather different Born Again albums. And then, you know, when we come on to Nashville Skyline, well, that's that's a whole different kind of contrast to the mid-60s work. He's, um, he's really simplifying the language he uses. So I remember the very first time I listened to that album, I was living in a an apartment in York, old York, not New York. And uh, I got this album, the vinyl, and uh, put it on the timetable downstairs where uh, my friend Paul lived. And um, we listened to this album. We were laughing our heads off because uh, it was so, he was so sly about the way that he brought in all this language from uh, Nashville. It was uh, it was such a clever album. It took a while before feeling that um, that he was only actually able to do that because he was being very respectful of the songwriting traditions that he was drawing upon. I mean, it is quite close to parody if all you think Bob Dylan normally does is Highway 61 revisited. Uh, all this, you know... My love, my baby, uh, you know, it's it's extremely pop music lyric content, uh, country pop. But obviously, it's very warm, and he's very fond of it. And and who couldn't be? I don't know anyone who doesn't like Nashville Skyline if they ever like Bob at all. Self portrait is different, of course, as we know from what Greil Marcus had to say when he first wrote about it in Rolling Stone.